Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. How to preach. How many of y'all know that? And if you're a guest this morning, don't get used to all these guest people up here speaking because that ain't happening. I'm very stingy with this pulpit. <laughs> right, Tristan? He's like, man, I thought the guy would never ask me to preach. And you may never get to again after next Sunday night. You never know. <laughs> Don't mess up. Um, starting a series this morning for the month of October, and we're calling it Scary Stories. Yeah, Scary Stories. So all of y'all get ready. Amen. Be scared. Glory to God. Um, I told a little story this morning. Uh, I don't have time to tell now. Cam took my time. Um, but uh, there's a... There, there was a challenge made in my house by, I won't name anybody, but my daughter challenged me uh, to, that I could not scare her and her brother. And by the time, the short version of the story is, by the time the night was over, they were both in tears. Now, I did not do that on purpose. But, you know, if you challenge somebody, it's on, right? And I'm telling, I told them, I said, within 10 minutes, within 10 minutes of you going to bed, I will have you in tears. And they were like, and David was like, Rachel, shut up. Because <laughs> dad will do it. And she was like, yeah, you just told us you're going to do it, so you can't scare us. <laughs> she was about 12. She's really smart. And I said, Rachel, please don't do this. I'm going to scar you for life, girl. And she's like, you can't scare me. There's nothing you can do. You just t- How are you going to scare us when you just told us you're going to do it? <laughs> I said, well, I'm just telling you. <laughs> it's 10 minutes. You're going to be in tears. So they had bunk beds. They went to bed. She was on the bottom bunk. Dave was on the top bunk. We went in their room. We prayed with them. We read their Bible to them. I said, you're going to need it here in a little bit. <laughs> uh, and I got to the light. Their mother had walked out. And I said, are you sure? She went, Dad. You are so funny. Like, what, you're going to come back down the hall and scare us? You're so funny. Shut the light off. Okay, fine. I went down the hall. Well, in our house back then, it was our first house. We didn't have a lot of noise in the house, and it was small, wood floors. You could hear everything. And so we laid in the bed. One minute. I laid there 60 seconds, and you could hear this conversation. And everything, all you could really hear was David saying, Shut up. We need to listen. And she was like, oh, David, you're so funny. Like, Dad's going to really scare us. Well, then they started talking back and forth. I got out of the bed. I got down on the ground. I crawled down the hallway, got to their door, and I sat by the door and listened for about a minute. And there, the conversation was awesome. It was one-sided. Rachel, Dad cannot scare us. He can't do it. There's no way. David's like, Rachel, if I tell you one more time to shut up, I'm going to come choke you. Be quiet. we got to listen. And while they're hollering, I got down on my belly and I scooted across the floor and I turned around and laid on my back right next to Rachel. I was literally a foot and a half from her head. And we're laying. She's in the bed. I'm in the the bunk beds real low and I'm laying beside her and she is talking trash and David's saying, shut up. And I'm doing this (laughs) in the dark. I was saying to myself, this is the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. (laughs) And after a few minutes of that, And they got, David finally got her quieted down. This is what she did. You know, she can't be quiet for long. She's quiet, and she got to thinking, David might be right. So I need to figure out where Dad is. So this is the first thing she says. Dad, I can hear her in the other bedroom. (laughs) Dad, Dad, are you in your bedroom? And I'm just <laughs> left. Dad! David's like, Rachel, please be quiet. So finally, they got quiet. And I reached over and grabbed that girl by the arm and shook her. And I'm going to tell you, the whole earth moved. They <laughs> screamed. The bed fell apart. <laughs> Pillows went flying, and I bust out laughing, and I flicked the light on, and both of them have tears running down their face. And, and to this day, Rachel will tell you, she says, I did it every night. 
That's her version of the story, isn't it? She tells it. She says, yeah, Dad used to scare us all the time. I did not. I scared him one time, but it was so good. He <laughs> didn't need a second dose. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I walked out of there laughing, and she was laughing. And to this day, Rachel will tell you, that's the scaredest I've ever been in my life. And she's still scared of the dark today. Today, I'm <laughs> She said, um, Macy said this morning, no, she's scared of her daddy. <laughs> I said, well, that may be true. And that's not a bad thing. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. So the title of this first message today is darkness. Darkness. I asked the children this morning, how many of y'all are afraid of the dark? Every one of them's hand went up. And then they started telling me how they go to bed. I heard some of the most interesting things in my life. One of them said that when I get ready to go to bed, I see little people under my bed and I go over to the light switch and I shut it off and I run and I jump in my bed and then I'm still scared. But when I pull the covers over my face, I think of my covers as God and I'm fine. I said, I'll let you preach this morning. It's awesome. Yeah. And uh, one of them, that, well, I want to tell you all the stories because some of them were really scary and I don't want to retell them. But they have their own fears. Darkness, in the beginning of time, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was, out, was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the first problem that was ever experienced on planet earth was darkness. The earth didn't have a form to it. It was void, meaning it was empty. The only thing there was dirt and water. And the water at that point encapsulated the earth. And it was dark. There was no light in it at all. It was void of light. It was perfect darkness. We went in the Wonder Cave years ago. I only went once. I will never go back. It's very traumatic. They didn't tell us this, but as you get in the bottom of the Wonder Cave, when you get to the bottom, they have dug a cave into the side of the cave, a little room kind of sort of in the rock, and it has a steel door on it that's sealed, and they open that up, and there's some benches, and you go in there and sit down, and they shut the door. And the lady says before she shuts the door, if you're claustrophobic, <laughs> help me, Jesus. I just, I, you know me. I was looking at the details. I was looking for the lock. Because if y'all going to lock me in here, it's going to be bad. Like, it's going to be a wild cat in a cage. I'm, I'm out of here. So, no, no lock. They said, no, we're not going to lock the door. And, and I just want to, we're going to make sure everybody's comfortable. Is everybody comfortable? Yeah. Okay, can I shut the door? Yeah. So, she shuts the door. Everybody okay? Take a few deep breaths. <gasps> she said, now, I can, I can guess that probably 99% of y'all have never been in absolute darkness. I'm fixing to put you in absolute darkness. When I flip this switch off, it's going to be absolutely dark. The door is sealed. There's no light coming in here. She said, now, I'm going to count to three. And I, believe me, if you say turn it back on, I'll turn it back on. We don't want anybody losing your mind. But we're gonna, I'll walk you through this. So one, two, three. And I'm telling y'all, it was dark. I never felt darkness like that. She said, everybody take a couple deep breaths. Everybody okay? Take a couple deep breaths. We're going to do an experiment. It's only going to last a few seconds. I'll turn the light back on, okay? She said, now, hold your hand out in front of you. Now, touch your nose. And this is what you heard. Flick the light on. How many of y'all hit yourself on the side of your face? How many of y'all hit your chest? She said, the reason is you've never been in absolute darkness. And I'd never felt that before. You have no sense of distance or anything. You've just kind of lost in the darkness. And you couldn't find where you really wanted your hand to go. Webster says that darkness is the absence of light. It talks about blackness and obscurity and gloom. He calls it a state of privacy or secrecy. I think all of you know what that has to do with us spiritually. <clears throat> Things that are in private and in the dark, they never come under the light. They tend to get worse. A state of ignorance or error, especially on moral 
or religious subjects. Hence, wickedness and impurity can be called darkness. That's according to the dictionary. Now, the world was in absolute darkness. <laughs> Everybody should say, thank God we don't live on that earth. Because we would have ran into each other. We couldn't have found what, where to go or how to go or what to eat. The animals were living in darkness. And I guess the only ones that would have been able to get around would be the possums. That was funny. They see in the dark. Okay, it's not funny. Not a lot going on on a, work, on a world that is void of light. Nothing to reflect. And, and God, it says he moved upon the waters. John, if you take your Bible, if you want to do a good little study, take Genesis chapter 1, about the first 12 or 15 verses, and take John chapter 1 and read them together, and you will see that what John is doing in John chapter 1 is he is teaching us about Genesis chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In other words, he says Jesus was the co-creator with God the Father from the beginning of time. And he says, in him, talking about Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So God's answer for darkness, the first problem we ever had on the planet was light. Light is the answer for darkness. I told the kids, I said, did that story about Miss Rachel, she's their teacher, by the way, Miss Rachel, was that, was that scary? And they all said, yes. I said, but hear the end of the story. I flipped the light on. What was in the room to be scared of? And one of them said, their daddy. <laughs> I said, that's a lie. There's nothing to scare in me. Let me remind you. Rachel dared me to do it. She challenged me to do it. It wasn't my idea. Are y'all listening this morning? I'm trying to preach here. It wasn't my idea. I can say it this way. God's idea is not for you to live in darkness, but to live in light. I said, so when the light came on, there was really nothing in the room to fear. There were no evil monsters. And if your mind tells you you've got evil monsters underneath your bed, flip the light on and you'll see they're not there. And so God said, I have, I've dealt with the darkness with light. Now, if you're like me, you always think when you read this scripture that God was talking about the sun and the moon and the stars. But those are cosmic lights. But I want to remind you of the order of things. This was on the first day of creation. On the first day of creation, God said, I'm going to deal with the first problem, which is darkness, by invading the darkness, dispelling the darkness, running it off the planet with the light of my word. God spoke light into existence. And it dispelled the darkness, and it released the life, what we would call the life of new creation. The new creation. It's life. You know, in, Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. He's literally talking about the same subject. There is a light that has nothing to do with sun, moon, and stars, and flipping light switches on, and electricity, and all of that. And it's the light of the gospel. It's the light of God's word. It's Jesus himself. And with this light that God brought about by Jesus, it brings energy and life. And it would eventually, through Christ, create spiritual illumination or light for us. Our darkened minds, a messed up humanity, 
because of what would go on in the garden, he was already creating the answer for it in Jesus Christ, releasing this light, releasing eternal life into the planet. <laughs> now, on the fourth day, yes, God created the sun, moon, and stars, and that's so we can function physically, but not the same light as the first day, which was the light of Jesus Christ. So look at this. The inability of the darkness to comprehend the light literally means that the darkness could not hinder or prevent it. As dark as it was in the wonder cave, as black as it felt, and the lady said, after she asked us, how many of y'all touched your face? I forgot. She left the light off a little longer. If Everybody okay? And everybody, you could hear people. <sighs> she said, what do you feel? And people began to speak, I feel heavy. I feel like it's thick in here, like I can't breathe. She said, that's right, because absolute darkness makes you feel that way. And that's what, that's what the darkness, what spiritual darkness to us, it, it makes us feel like I can't breathe anymore. I can't handle this anymore. I can't, I don't know how to go forward. How am I going to get over this thing that has taken over my life and it becomes oppressive and it waits on us? Like we've got giant weight sitting on our shoulder and you know hunched over in the spirit because of it because i can't get out from under this thing but when the light switch came on in the wonder cave as thick as that darkness was it could not stop the light light is incredible uh i just got to have a conversation with a, a professional from at&t and he works in the uh uh fiber optics division and I didn't know anything about fiber optics you know they don't this, this is not something that the average contractor deals with and uh, Bob brought me a piece he had a piece of uh, fiber optic cable uh, I should have just kept it for illustration but uh, it's tiny I mean it's 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 like it looks like a like this cord right here it's about this size and inside it is hundreds of I don't know how many thousands hundreds of strands of of what we call fiber optics I always thought it was fiberglass but Bob has a tool to 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 get to one piece of that which is very difficult and um, he had a piece sticking out about that far and I found I was I found out it's not it's not fiberglass it's glass it is hundreds and thousands of little glass tubes inside that cable and so when I talked to this professional last week I said I said, how far, and, and you got to understand, I mean, he, he can tell you, it, 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 it's almost hard to see with your eye. It's so small. It's smaller than the needle that the doctor sticks you with. I mean, I, I've seen the baby needles for little children or the one they put in your hand is super, super tiny. This is tinier than that. And, and yet, through that can come billions of bits of information in one second in one second billions of information can go through that tiny little fiber optic tube and and I, I, I said I said well, well tell me more about it how to how, how far I mean that's a small signal how far can y'all send light down that before you start losing some some of its value he said 35 miles we're not talking about an LED light on one of those 12 cell flashlights, you know, that the police officers used to hit us with. When my dad was a police officer, you could hit people and he had one of those. That flashlight scared me to death, man, because it did tear you up. And now they don't let you hit people. So, you know, you are safe. But, but that thing, you, we go out at night and my dad would turn that thing on and almost burn trees down. I mean, it's like a laser beam. <laughs> You know, it looked like, felt like Darth Vader out there, just <laughs> tree, trees falling. And, 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 and this is not like that. This is microscopic light. 35 miles, billions of pieces of information. And then Bob just verified to me that in Houston, in the Houston system, there are, in, in one, look at me, one second, in one second, there are trillions of pieces of information that flow from one side of the city of Houston to the other to keep downtown under fiber optics. 
trillions of pieces of information in a second that come in little blips and blurps. So think of this. It's not just one beam of light that just keeps going. It is trillions of flashes of light that send bits of information in one second. I'm trying to get you to see the power of just light. And we're not just talking about just light. I'm talking about the light of the gospel of Christ, which is a zillion times not even comparable to the light a flashlight can put out. And so this first problem on one side, we have darkness, and God's answer to it is light. And then because I'm a songwriter, um, my next point is man in the middle. Uh, you don't want me to do that. <laughs> I'm looking at the man in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, in the mirror. I said mirror. I know, but I said I wrote this one, man in the middle. She's always messing with my sermons, brother. It's terrible. That's why you travel without your wife. I got it now. I got it. It's not fair. You don't play fair. It's not fair. If she was here, she'd keep you in line. Amen. <laughs> But there's a man in the middle, right? Yeah. It's me. It's you. On one side is the darkness. On the other side is the light. And I'm the man in the middle. <laughs> so John comes along. This is what he says in chapter, in chapter 1, verse 6. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's talking about himself. And he said, the same came for a witness. We had a witness this morning, right? We had a witness this morning who testified to you that God is real. And the way she knows that is she said, God is working in my life and God is doing great things in my life and God is changing me. And then she doesn't know it, but it was a perfect illustration of this point. She said, but I'm afraid that I will relapse. Cam, the reason we're afraid is because we're the man in the middle. We understand darkness because we've been in it and we don't like it. And we've experienced the light, and in the moment we experience it, it is the most exhilarating thing that can ever happen in your life. And once we've had that, we should have a good fear. I don't want to go back to the darkness. <laughs> so he said, I came to witness this to you, to bear witness of the light, that all men, through Jesus, through him, might believe. He was not that light. He's talking about himself but was sent to bear witness of that light, that that was the true light which lighteth every man that comes into the world. Jesus, he's the true light of the world. He said, I was a forerunner. I came and preached the light. I preached the gospel. Some people thought in that day that John the Baptist might have been the Christ. They even would say that. And he said, no, I am not that man. I'm not the Christ. I'm a forerunner of the Christ. I came to tell you about Christ. The light that I'm giving you, I'm just, a, I'm just, come on, look at, I'm just the fiber optic cable that the light is flowing through. I'm not the light. I'm just the conduit. But he's the light, Jesus Christ. Now, he said he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world didn't know him. He came into his own, and his own didn't even receive him. But he said, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I looked out my front yard about three years ago, and there's a guy bent down on the ground, and he's working in our front yard. He, there was a box at the front of our house. I, it was an old, I guess it's an old telephone box, and it's got umpteen zillion wires in it. Every time they pull the top off, it gives me anxiety. I mean, I would hate to be the guy that wired it. It's, it's just crazy, every color under the rainbow. And, and this guy's out there for hours. I went out there, and I said, hey, bud, what's up? He goes, oh, I'm fixing to make you real happy. And I thought, hmm, good luck with that. And he said, he said, uh, we're, 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 we're about to put fiber optics in your neighborhood. Well, you know, when you're 62 year olds, fiber optics, that means nothing. Now to this group, they go, oh, oh, I have fast internet. I said, what does that mean for me? He said, well, I'm about to make your life better. 
I was thinking he's going to give us some free steaks from Omaha Steaks or something like that. No, he said, he said we're going to put fiber optics in, and y'all going to have super fast internet in your neighborhood. I said, well, that would be good. That would be good. That was three years ago. We still use the old Flintstone way. We pull out the string with the rocks, and we tap it together, and the computer comes on. We're still under that. I mean, it's so slow. David and Blake have just about... Well, you can see Blake, he's pulled all his hair out, and uh, <laughs> David's working on it, and it's all about the internet, and, you know, David's paid hundreds of dollars to get faster internet, and then just recently, Blake paid a bunch of money, we pay, I don't know what they pay a month to get faster internet, and um, everybody's always trying to do that, and here's the deal. The guy said, when we get this in, because they're putting it in a new neighborhood, now, I'll tell you all the sad part of the story, they put it in my front yard went across the street to the new neighborhood, and I can't connect to it. Mm. Our country is so messed up. It's my neighbor. It's my yard. <laughs> huh? Mm. And y'all moved in my neighborhood. And y'all are stealing my internet. <laughs> Probably paying 20 bucks a month or something. Yeah, I got, I, don't say a word, I got it. <laughs> I got you now. I got you figured out, brother. Yeah, I forgot about that. Wow. You never know who your enemies are. <laughs> Could be right next to you in a pew. No, I'm glad Noah got good internet. That's awesome. That's awesome. We want to keep Noah up to date. And here's the deal. Look at this. If you're in the middle of this thing, let's just stay on this thing. If you've got bad internet over here and good net internet over there, this is real simple. This is simple gospel. The side you connect to, that's the amount of light you're going to get. That's the amount of information you're going to get. That's the amount of progress you're going to get. So I guess they don't want us to progress, Brother Randy. They won't give me the Internet. So Elon Musk came along, staying on the theme, Jesus. And Elon Musk said, I'll give you Sky Internet. You can get it anywhere in the country. Bob Newsom got it, and he told me, he said, ha! Take my trailer, we park it anywhere in America. I got perfect internet, fastest internet in the whole little RV park. I said, woo. <laughs> so he convinced Bob, too, to buy it. Bob said, I got the best internet in the RV park. I said, that's why I don't go to RV parks. I can't compete. <laughs> but you have to connect to it. If you can't connect to it, you don't have it. It doesn't matter if it's in your front yard, Carol. You don't have it because we're not connected to it. Oh, I hope you're listening by the Spirit this morning because the darkness that invades our life, sometimes we just get used to it and it's okay and we can function in it. We've learned how to stumble around in the dark. Uh, my wife, you know, built an obstacle course this week in our house. She took all the cabinets apart to fresh paint them and she had the doors set on the little bar stools and she put them right where I walk in the morning when I get up. And I got up in the dark at 6 o'clock and I walked into the living room. It must have been a God thing. Because I walked in there and I hit one of those things and I and, and just barely hit it and I stopped. And I grabbed my phone and I went, wow. And I looked around me. I was standing in a maze. <laughs> I would have woke the whole neighborhood up if I'd have took one more step. Everything would have been falling everywhere like dominoes. But we get used to walking in the dark. But the problem is, in the darkness, no matter how good you are at traversing the darkness, you eventually run into something that's going to rip your life apart. There are, phys there are people that are physically blind from birth, and they get good at functioning in the dark. But even those people who live their whole life in darkness, they eventually have to get some help because they're going to go places they've never been. They're going to walk places they don't know anything about. 
So they get them a CNI dog that's been trained to lead them, and they get, or they get somebody. I watched a runner. You might have saw this recently. The lady that just broke a record for blind people. She had a man run beside her, and he literally, she had her hand on his shoulder the whole time they were running, and she's learned how to do that. I, I'll just say, don't try that at home. You will trip and fall and break something. But she's learned how to do it, but she still needs help. And you may learn how to live in the darkness, but I promise you, you're still going to need help. And you'll never have the kind of life God wants for you. See, light is life, and life comes from Jesus. You say, but I'm alive. Yes, but you can be the walking dead. That's what Paul calls us the walking dead. He said men are walking around in darkness and they are dead and they don't know they're dead. How do you think Hollywood came up with all these movies, zombie movies, right out of the Bible? Because that's what, that's what the Bible calls us, just mindless, wandering around in the darkness, crashing into stuff, life falling apart, life is killing us. Because we don't have the light of the gospel. But I want you to hear this this morning. Light and darkness cannot coexist. Now, there's some people who say there are no absolute facts. Well, if you can figure this one out, you're smarter than them. Because you can't take a room. <laughs> there's no, look, we can turn off half the lights in this building right now. And this side will become a little dimmer then this side, if we leave the lights on, but there's not darkness over there. The light will penetrate whatever it can get to. And so you can't take a room and say one half is darkness and the other is light. You can't draw that line and make it happen. It doesn't work that way. It's too penetrating. Light gets into everything. We turned the lights off the other day and my wife well, you can see it right now. If you look real close, right up there, right above that light, right up there against the wall, there's a sh little sliver of light coming through. And my wife said, you know, you didn't insulate that very well. <laughs> it, it, look, being married to an inspector is, is difficult as a contractor. It's just been difficult, okay? And she said, you, you, I said, honey, we've got part of the soffit off out there until they get the metal up. And the light goes down. Now, look at that. The light comes in way over there, but it penetrates all the way down the bottom of that eave inside those two metals, and you can see the sun coming through in a few little spots. I said, honey, that's because we didn't do a perfect job of trying to insulate that. We just stuffed some insulation in there to get by. That's how penetrating light is. And so the two cannot coexist alone because of this reason, the word in Genesis, light dispels darkness. It does away with it. It casts it off. It runs it out of the house. It runs it out of your life. The darkness cannot stay with the light. It is impossible. It's like putting a wild cat and a wild dog in the same cage. Somebody's going to die. <laughs> Micah asked us on the way to church this morning, which is faster, cats or dogs? I said, cats. He said, why? I said, because God didn't want them to die every time they met a dog. He said, really? I said, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's true or not, but it sounds good. I said, you ever seen a cat that was slower than a dog? No, that's why. God said they give them away as escape. <laughs> they can't coexist. It just doesn't work. And it won't work in your life either. See, only the light, Jesus, can run the darkness out of our lives and flood our souls with eternal life. Let me give you a couple scriptures real quickly. Isaiah 59 and 10 says, We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. That's what happens when the light is not in our life. That's not living. Hear me, that's not living. 
There's a way to be alive and not be alive. And this is it. To walk in darkness and never know Christ. Spend your whole existence and never know the one that created you. It's a miserable way to live. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the heart. A heart can only be blinded, and we're not talking about your beating physical heart. He's talking about the central part of a person, who you are, the heart of a man, the, what, what, what you are. You, it, you, who you are can literally be blinded to ever see the light. Oh, God, help us to take the blinders off and not be caught up in trying to figure out Please hear me this morning. You don't have to figure out how to live. People spend their whole life saying, I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't know my purpose. I can't. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be. Yes, right, because you don't have any life in you. But when you get the life of Christ in you, all those questions are answered. Now I know why I'm in existence. I know I've been made for a reason. I've been called out and set apart for a purpose. And, and I'm now a part of the royal priesthood of God. And there's royal blood flowing through my veins. And my, yes, my old man is still in the middle. And he's still fighting off the darkness and trying to submit to the light. But I got a spiritual understanding now. I am God's child. Hallelujah. My future is sealed in heaven because of Christ. I'm on my way to spend my eternity with him. Amen. You don't have to walk around blind. And then 1 John 1 and 7 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Come help me, Zoe. This morning, we are going to receive communion together.